you got your Bible, let's go again to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 36. I don't know how many of y'all read ahead of this, but uh, some of these names can be challenging, but I'm going to do the best I can with them. And I'll explain that here in a few minutes. Genesis chapter 36, starting in verse 1. It said, Now these are the generations of Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughter of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elion, the Hittite, and uh, Ahoyabama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zebian, the Hivite, Ashmath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth, and Ada bare Esau, Elpaz, and Bashmath bare Ruel, and Ahoyabama bare Jews, and Jalem, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all the beasts and all the substance which he had got in the land of Canaan and went into that country from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were, much, were, were more than the mighty that they might dwell together and the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, again, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, that you've allowed us back in your house. And Lord, again, we just want to thank you and praise you for that. Lord, now we thank you for your word. Lord, and ask that you help us in the scriptures. And again, Lord, we ask you to expound them to us. Lord, explain them to us. Lord, help us with them. And Lord, again, give us what we need for the days to come. And Lord, we be careful to give you all the glory, praise, and honor for all that's done. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things and for his sake. Amen. You go through, especially when you get into the Chronicles and you go through all the genealogy and all that, a lot of people, they just skip over it. They, won't, they, they say, well, what's the use? All, none of them names make sense to me, and, and they'll just go right over them. But I'm reminded there in 2 Timothy 3.16 when Paul, he says this, he says, all Scripture, you know, there's that little word all again. You know what all means? All means all. That all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Well, like I said, there we, we'd be inclined to skip over this chapter, but because Esau is an important type of the flesh in scripture, the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to pin down this spiritual truth for us. Aren't you glad that we can go to everything in God's Word and it is spiritual truth? There's not a lie in this book. There's not a, uh, uh, there's not a contradiction in there. There's not anything in here that's going to lead you astray. And we know that uh, everything in here was inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know, God instructed 40 different men over 1,500 years how He wanted His Word pinned down. And we've got that, and it's all in there for a reason. So we look here at these names and all that. But if, I want you to take notice there. We started in verse 1. He said, now these are generation of Esau. He says, who is Edom? Drop down to verse 9. There dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. He's reminding us that Esau was just a man, but look at the family. Look at, look at what he's done. And we'll get into that more you know, later on. But uh, all this is in there for a reason. It's all in there for purpose. You know, It's not something to be, to be skipped over or anything like that. But if we go back and we look at uh, we look at Jacob and Esau, you know the battle in the womb between Jacob and Esau. We've seen that, but then there we've seen a truce. You know there at Isaac's funeral, but we've seen a truce there. Uh, you know it was called for a time, but the struggles between Israel and Esau boiled down through the centuries, blossoming to a full scale war between the descendants of Jacob and Esau. And if you go back, and, if, and I'm getting ahead of myself, I know if you go back and look where Abraham, where he come from? Well, he didn't, when well, it was time for a wife, you know, for his children. I mean, he didn't say, well, just go out in there and find you, you know, one. You, you, there's women out there, you'll find somebody. No. He, 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 he was real diligent about getting them back from his family, from where God pulled him out of, 
to keep that line. He didn't want, God didn't want them mixing with the Canaanites, with the people of the land. He didn't want that. That just wasn't, that wasn't going to happen. It wasn't His plan. But here we see, every time we've seen that, something went wrong. Even go back to Hagar. Where was Hagar from? She was an Egyptian. And, you know, Sarah was getting impatient, couldn't have any kids, so she said, well, here, take my handmaid Hagar and, and you know, we'll get you a son that way. We, don't, we can't rush the things of God. Every time we try to rush the things of God, what happens? We fall on our face. We get, we get in trouble, don't we? And, and I'm going to say more about that later on. But we just got to be patient in the things of God. We got to be patient in what He does in our lives. But we got to be extra patient with what He does in our church. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I, I, I was thinking about this as, as we go through here about how fast things happen on one side, but how slow things happen on the other side. What, there's an old saying, what is slow? Or good things come to those who wait. You know, now I'm not saying go plop down on a chair somewhere and just sit there and say, okay, Lord, I'm waiting on you. Just let me know when it gets here. I'm not saying that. But we need to be patient in things like that. Esau wasn't, he wasn't patient. Of course, now he had a little bit of a grudge too, you know, with his birthright and all that. But it don't matter. He's still part of that line that if he would have stayed with, with, his, with his kind, if I can say it that way, instead of going out to the world, we wouldn't be reading about what we're reading here. And you say, well, why do you say that? I'm saying, well, but the Holy Spirit pinned it down because we can see the spiritual truths here in the way we're supposed to do in life. So if we look there and we see that... Uh, the immediate family of, of Esau. We said two things must be kept in mind. Here, you know, uh, Esau's unsuccessful compromise and Esau's unceasing carnality. You know, think about how carnal this world's getting today. You think about, uh, we, I mean, look at, look at our young people. And when I say our young people, I'm not talking about our church, I'm talking about young people in general. We've all probably got Friends or family that's got a teenager or, or family that's just gone off out in the world, that's just, just doing all kind of wicked, crazy, if I can say it this way, stupid stuff. Now, my grandson said that's not a nice word. Well, it's not, but when I'm talking about something like this, what I'm getting at, this is the, how carnal that the world's getting, but we see that how carnal that Esau was here. So we look there and we see these two things about him. Look at his parents. They were godly people. You say, well, how come if they were so godly, how come he turned out that way? Can I say it like this? And, and I'm, not, I, I'm not trying to be mean. Uh, I never had a brother. I, I always wanted a brother, but God blessed me with two sisters. And I, we fought like cats and dogs, but we still loved each other. But here, these two brothers, when they, when they had that quarrel, you know, whenever uh, Jacob, he said he stole his birthright. Well, in a way he did. But right there, they was a, there was a, a, a divider or a fence put between them boys, and they never was the same. I wonder how they were when they were little growing up, when they were June age and Noah. I mean, how, now these boys were twins. They were just minutes apart in age, so they were the same. How were the reckon they were growing up? I'd like to think that they were two twin brothers out there running and playing and having fun and doing their chores and, and doing what mom and dad said. I don't know. But it comes a time in life when there was sometimes family, they get they have a disagreement in something like that, and it changes the whole thing, no matter how godly their parents was. How many times have you seen teenagers or, or young people rebel against their parents? Even though I've seen preachers, sons and daughters, go out in the world and was just as wicked as anybody out there, and they were raised up and knew better. Esau knew better here. We need to pray for them people. But you know what? Esau could have turned it around just as easy, but he chose not to. But the Holy Spirit is giving us a, a he's giving us an outline here of how not to live how to go with God and not go with the world. But there we see that, uh, that his parents were godly people. 
you know, and his marriage to these pagan women probably, and what well, it did distressed them greatly. But we look at Esau's marriage, and, and we'll look at this one, Alohobama, you know, particularly must have been especially abhorrent to them, for she was not only the daughter, you know, the daughters of Canaan, she was of a Horite ancestry. And the Horites had a strong Anakin strain that they were a race of giants that so polluted the promised land. What was it whenever, uh, we see later whenever uh, Joshua and them, and they're getting ready to cross over the River Jordan, and they send spies over there? How many did they send? They sent 12 spies, didn't they? They come back. How many of them had a good report? Two of them. What did the other one say? Don't, they're, we're as like grasshoppers in their sight. That's who they're talking about. They were these Anakins. And here it is. We see that even back early, we see that they were, were trying to get into God's family. Aren't you glad they didn't get in? Aren't you glad they didn't get in? Y'all will have to help me now. Aren't you glad that we got in? But they didn't get in. But there it is. Don't you think they were trying? The devil, ever since he was cast out of heaven, ever since he came to the Garden of Eden, he has tried his best to destroy the family of God. Everywhere we turn, everywhere we look at, he has tried his best to get in there and destroy the family of God. He's even trying right here. The thing about him right here, he probably thinks he's winning now because he's got both of them instead of just one of them. But there we see that that was, you know, they were the ones that polluted the promised land. And then we look there at, uh, look at the first, you know, talking about Adiah, the daughter of Elion, the Hittite. And look at there, you know, uh, her name means ornament. And I'll get into this other one here in a minute. But all these names that we're so apt to skip over, because they are, it's challenging to, to pronounce them. And I, I don't do them justice. I, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm like Moses told God, I'm not an eloquent speaker. But, but there it is, we see that these names, all these names mean something, and that's there for a reason. And look at this, her name means ornament. And you think, well, what's ornament? Ornament is to decorate, is to show off. You know, well, ornament is something that you would put up to, if they come in and say, boy, that's nice, I like it. What about the names of these people, what they mean? I believe when Esau saw her, he saw her as a sparkling jewel. It's something he said, whoa. There's something about that. What is the devil, what's the first thing he's going to try to do to get your attention? He's going to put something through, and try to get it through your eye gate. And if he can't get through your eye gate, he's going to try to come through your ear gate. And if he can't do that, he's going to try to come through your, your, your nose, your smelling, or, or your taste, or your touch. He's going to use all five senses. But we look at these names of these people, I believe that, they, that it's just like uh, when you go fishing. You've got to have an attractive bait to lure the fish in. We'll put these attractive ornaments out there to Esau because he wanted him to fall even harder because he couldn't get to the rest of them. He couldn't get to Jacob. He tried. You say, well, Jacob messed up, Jacob done up. I'd like to be just a little bit of what was on the bottom of Jacob's shoes. Because God had confidence in him. God used him, and God showed mightily through him. But there it is, we see that Esau, he went after the sparkly things. He went after the glitter things. He went after the big lights of the big city. And we can see that in these names. But there it is. Her name means ornament. The name Adai would have been uh, repugnant to Isaac for another reason. The family records, you know, handed down from Noah preserved the memory of uh, Ada. That's how you need to pronounce, how you need to pronounce that. Now. Ada, the wife of, of uh, Lamech, the great arch rebel before the flood. So see, even, even though she wasn't part of that, but her name was. And so, can you imagine when you, Isaac and he hears that name, all he's thinking about is what Noah said about him. 
said just about that name. Names are so important in Scripture. They're not to be skipped over. We need to pay attention to these, and these, these lineages and these family, you know, it's important there. It's, God put it in there for a reason. So we look there, the name alone was terrible sound in his ears, especially knowing her uh, Hittite origin. Isaac had not forgotten the care that Abraham had taken to make sure that such lineage would not pollute the genealogy of the chosen race. Aren't you glad for when, when people, and I think about stuff that, that, that my grandmother, my great-grandmother, me and my great-grandmother spent a lot of time sitting on her front porch. I used to love going over there. I mean, when I was little, I'd walk through the woods. I'd look both ways across the road. Of course, you'd look both ways for an hour and not see nobody come by, but <laughs> it's different now. But we'd go over there and we'd see it, and she would tell me about different things, you know, about when she grew up up in Davidson River up there, you know. And she would tell me about her and, and, uh, and my great-great-uncle John and, and she'd tell me about all, all my kinfolk. She'd tell me about growing up up there and how they used to do and how they used to live and how good it was, you know. And she said, she said I'd get on the wagon with Daddy. We'd go to town in the wintertime. And she said, a team of horses and a wagon would cross the French Broad River and wouldn't even crack the ice. It is here, it's been brought down even from Noah. But Abraham, he stressed to them, here's the do's and don'ts on the marriage. And he said, it isn't because this isn't what Abraham said. This is what God has said. So what I'm getting at is, aren't you glad that, that we've got a godly heritage that people have handed down stuff? And some people say, well, I can't say that. But there's somebody in your life that can hand down something to you, that can tell you something. I mean, Brother Claude, you, you probably remember stuff that, that your mother and your father has taught you, you know, when this church, I mean, even, and you think, well, how long goes that mean? It don't matter, but still, it's still in there. And I'm sure that you, take, you pass that on to your children. And we need to get it passed on to our grandchildren. But there it is. We see where, where you know, a, a godly heritage needs to be passed down and handed down. The good and the bad. Just like we were talking back there in the prayer room back there. A preacher that will stand up here and all he wants to do is, is preach on this side of the skills and preach heaven all the time and not preach hell. He's not doing what he needs to do. Preacher needs to balance the scales. You need to preach. Jesus, Jesus' scales wasn't balanced. You think, whoa, how do you say it? He preached a lot more about hell than he ever did about heaven. I don't know where that come from, but there it is. But now we go back to the first number. That, that uh, Aloha Obama, her name mean, means tent of the high place. And you think, tent of the high place, what kind of name is that? It wasn't her name as much as what she did. There it is. The devil is hanging out these sparkly things for Esau to come in. He's trying to destroy this family. He's still trying to destroy this family. There's still turmoil, turmoil between the line of Jacob and the line of Esau. There is still battles going on over there about all this. But there we see, you know, her, that her name would infer that she, uh, she could have had a temple, you know, the job of a temple priestess. Now, I'm not talking about a temple like what Jesus and all them worshiping. All these pagans, they had, made, I mean, magnificent temples. But it was pagan. It was, it was, it was wicked. It was, and here it is, this is what her, her name means, Ten of the High Place. And we go back to, go on through the Scripture and look. What did, some of the, what did some of the good kings of Israel do? What was one of the first things they did? They tore down the high places because they would try to get up as high as they could to do their idol worship and all that. Well, that's these Canaanites. And, and, I, and I had a chance to see some of these Canaanite towns and stuff, the ruins of them over there in Israel. And I'm telling you what. That goes from the uh, from the Holiday Inn to the what's the one that they leave a light on for you? That some some of them are better than others, but they were see. I mean, they were extravagant the way they done these things. But they had their high places too. 
There was one we seen, and they had they had all this. They had these big baths. They had a way to heat the water. I mean, all this stuff. But they still had a high place, and that's where their temple was. Well, here, this one, she was a priestess in the high temple, in the high place there, in the temple of the pagan worship. So we look there, and we see see that you know, for the a prostitute for the Canaanite worship. But this seemed to have been Esau's favorite wife. Her profession would appeal to the carnal mind of Esau. She would have been the chief wife by bearing him three sons, whereas the other two only bear one each. So, so we look at this and we, we look, at, look at, the, at their names and look at how you say, well, Preacher, where are you going for all this? I'm just trying to, I'm trying to get help myself out of here. And you say, what are you talking about? I'm t- they, this is in here for a reason. This is in here just like Abraham handed on down and had it come on down the line like that. We should do the same thing. Say, well, I don't have children. I may not have grandchildren. You know what? We've all got somebody we can hand this down to. We can hand down our godly heritage to, and we can hand down the do's and don'ts of what God, you know, what the word of God. And then we see, thirdly, we see Bashmath, whose name means spice. So we've got an ornament, we've got a tent of the high place, and we've got spice. Now think about that. What are some of the things that the devil tries to tempt us, tempt all of us with? An ornament, something shiny, something, something bright. And you think, well, they go to church. They must be all right. Not everybody that goes to church is right with the Lord. Can I say that? Can I say that again? Not everybody that goes to church is right with the Lord. There are some, some, uh, some churches that think it's okay to have a, a woman preaching or a woman deacon or something like that. They're no different than what this one is on the tent of the high place if they come in and think they can move in behind that. And I, now, there's been women up here, but there ain't been a woman up here preaching. And I ain't been here that long, but I, I know enough about Wolf Creek to know that that's never happened, and it never will happen. But we see the names of these and how that the devils used that to attract Esau to them. But the wives of Esau are kept before us in this chapter, but it was the Horite wife who predominated. The Edomite race contained three important elements. There was one Canaanite, one Horite, and one Ishmaelite. (coughs) It's no wonder that this race would settle down to a granite hard hostility toward Israel. So you see how this family is developing here? Every piece in that family is developing is, is is, is ammunition to fire toward God's people, to Israel. They've all got something. They've got a hatred. They've got a, a where somebody's, you know, and I'm talking about generations. You know, a couple thousand years down the road, they're still holding against them folks back there. And it's still just as solid today as it was when Jacob and Ishma, Ishma, or I mean when Jacob and Esau had their partner ways there. There's still that much animosity towards the children of Israel. But there we see that hostility toward Israel. And then we see where Esau would have his support in Seir. It goes down through there in verse 8. It says, in, Then dwelt Esau on Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. But if you go back before that, we look here in verse 6. You know, And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance with that he got in the land of Canaan and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more than that they might dwell together, and the land wherein there were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. So see, he already had a little bit, but now he's getting ready to get more. He's getting ready to grow stronger and all that. But we see that this, that, that, uh, that there's, you know, Seir is the home of Ahoyabah, or Bama, where she held rank among her father, 
one of the Horite dukes. Esau would be well received, so like Lot before Esau moved away from the place of fellowship with the people of God, you know, where the people, instead of being persuaded by the people of God, and could find more congenial company in the world. It happens every day. There's people leaving the church because they got mad, they got their feelings hurt, or something. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not picking on Betty. I'm just, I'm just stating fact here. But yet, they left the fellowship of God because somebody out in the world held up that, that ornament. They had that high place, or they had that spice out there, and they're leaving the fellowship of God to go out in the world because that's something more attractive out there. I'm telling you, it's sad. If you run out of something to pray, pray for them people. Pray for them people that, that were raised up in church and then all of a sudden one day they just said, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go find something different. There's something different out there, all right, but there's not anything better out there than the fellowship of being with God's people. We've seen what happened a lot. Yeah. The grass is greener on the other side until the fire and brimstone started falling. But here it is. I want you to look at this. It's strange that all Esau's sons were born in Canaan but turned their backs upon it, whereas Jacob's sons, all but one, he's talking about Benjamin, were born out of the land of promise, but found their place in their last. Isn't that something, How These boys, they were born in Canaan. They had opportunity to be in the fellowship of God, but because of their family were around them, they went off out in the world. They went off out there to the carnal, ungodly thing because they seen the ornament, they seen the shiny thing, they seen the spice, and they seen the high places. They thought, I'll be better off over there than I am over here. They left Canaan. But yet, here it is. Isn't this it, something how God can work? He took all these that was born in Peter Maram and in all this, and yet brought them into the promised land. Brought them in over there to be fellowship with God. Now, did all of them do right? No. Some, did some of them mess up? Yeah, they did. Anybody that hadn't ever messed up in here, raise your hand. Not a, not a hand raised. We can't, we can't do it, can we? But you see what I'm saying here? If, you, if you'll stay in the fellowship of God, you won't care what country you're in. But you're going to strive to get to His place. You're going to strive to get to be with God's people in the house of God. But there it is. It's funny how those two it turned around. But Esau's decision was typical of the flesh which always finds the world a more congenial place than the meeting place of the people of God, like I said earlier. But through the generation of Esau, we can see that the families of the carnal race in this world develop themselves more rapidly than the promised seed. They've got... Now, don't, don't take me wrong on this. But you look at... How many rich people do you know it's never darkened over church has got everything they could ever want. And they got it just like that. How many people do you know that they don't want for a thing? And everything not, yeah, they got just been handed right to them. But yet, ask them who the Lord is. They don't know. They ain't got a clue. Should we, be, should we covet that? Should we be jealous of that? No. How many people raise your hand and say, I'm thankful for everything that God's given me? No matter how much or how little, if God gives it to me, I'm thankful. Amen. So we see that Esau and Ishmael, and they got their stuff in a hurry. They got cattle, they got family, they got, I mean, they loaded. They got servants, and they got everything just like that. How long did it take Jacob to get where he was at? He spent 20 years. Just, just serving 
I mean, what he, he served seven years for Rachel and in seven more or seven years and got Leah and then seven more years for Rachel. But he ended up spending 20 years, but yet he, he was able to get something like that. Ishmael and Esau, they got theirs pretty quick. But that don't mean it worse to be jealous of them or to covet what they've got. We need to be patient. So there we see that theirs comes sooner than the possession of Isaac and Jacob. But the promised seed seems as a slow growth. But we are in God's time, not the world's. Aren't you glad you're on God's time? No matter how long it takes, He's going he's to provide for us. He's going to give us what we need. He's going to give us what we need when we need it. If we don't think, and I think that's another problem that's in the church, is people impatient. I've shared this with you. How many times has Debbie heard me say, what's wrong with the stove? The water ain't boiling yet. You just turned it off. <laughs> well, ain't that done yet? It's a microwave. You just turned it off. But we don't need to be impatient with the things of God. The things that He's given us, the thing how He's helped us, the things He's brought us through, the things that He's going to bring us through. He'll bring them on His time, not the world's time. If you get to trying to do it on the world's time, you're going to be chasing after those shiny things, those spicy things in those high places. You say, preacher, you're confusing. You tell us what we need to be looking up. We need to be looking up to God, not looking up to the things that man has set up on a pedestal. But there it is. The fulfillments of all God's promises are always long in coming in our eyes. But the kingdom of this world will soon fade while the kingdom of heaven will endure forever. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you happy about that? Because you know what? The thing in this world don't matter. But our flesh thinks, yeah, it does matter. Well, there's some things we got to have. we got to have oxygen. we got to have a little bit to live on. You know, it's nice to have lights, but we don't have to have them. we got to have some heat. It's nice to have air conditioning. What I'm getting at is we need a lot of things, but we need God more than we do anything that this world has to offer. No matter how shiny it looks, how spicy it smells, or, or tastes, or how high that somebody's put something up there. That's the thing that Esau went after. And guess who was dangling all that in front of him? Satan himself. So as we look here and we go through, this, this, this chapter here is, is dedicated to Esau, you know, and the Edomites. But if we look through there, it's not there for just to fill up pages in a book. That's just not a bunch of black words on right paper. This was all inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if I look there, and if I take anything away from that, what we've looked at tonight, the devil's always going to be trying to dangle something in front of you to pull you away from the fellowship of God. And can I tell you this? Don't do it. But get away from God for a while. Get away from God's people for a while. Get away from reading that book for a while and see what happens. You'll find, you'll eventually, you'll be drawn closer to the other side. That's what Esau done. But all Scripture is there for a reason. Because we're seeing here what not to do. You see, sometimes it's hard to swallow that. What our job is now, we need to pass this on to somebody else. You know people that's out in the world that have succumbed to all these things that, we, that Esau did. They can still, they still make it back. As long as they're breathing, God the Holy Spirit can draw them near to where they can. All they got to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry. How many prodigals do you know that's out there? The prodigal son has a way back. Because even though he got pulled to the things of the world out there, he was taught right to start with. You say, well, you got a different message now. It is. But it's still the same. Esau never come back. 
He was still part of that family. He never come back. Church, we need to pray for those that they, some of them out there will come back. Some of those that's getting drawn out there, please don't go. There's room at the king's table. There's a little place over there that you can get over by yourself. Go back to the foot of the cross. You don't have to get saved again, but you need to remember where you come from and go back instead of going out with the world. Let's stand. I'm, I'm done. Anybody got a word? You know, I say this, it's just us. Well, Debbie told Carrie about that, our soon-to-be daughter-in-law. Well, that's one of her favorite sayings now. She, and she reminded me the other night, she said, it's just us. <laughs> You're a monk family. Anybody got a word before we close? through that I thought to myself that I sure am thankful that I know what it's like to come from the worldly things the shiny you know all the dazzling and shiny things and coming to this versus coming from this and going to that Amen. Amen. I sure am thankful for that even though it was I mean there's a lot of things but and there's another part of it that you said that um, knowing how what not to do I said that a million times through my childhood and teenage years that I learned a lot of what I didn't want to do as a parent and what not to do and I'm thankful for that too you hear you hear Brother Martin talking all the time about like disaster relief and all that he said we can't tell you how to do everything but he said we can write a book on what not to do mm -hmm. but you know what yeah. book right here <laughs> it tells you what to do and what not to do. Amen. There's no gray area in there. It's all plain. True. Anybody else?